You're listening to a SodaCon Sessions by Effective, live from a SodaCon 2023. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in for this next episode of Asotocon Sessions presented by Effective. Live right here for Asotocon 2023. We get a chance to catch up with Dana Cleave, who's the Director of Diversity, oh, Engagement, Engagement. and Foundation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, just to kind of like recap on this real fast, Dana, first off, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. And for those who don't know what Director of Diversity, Engagement, and Foundation is, like, tell us what that is. <laughs> like, who does? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so, I do. Uh, yes. Now you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I think sometimes when I'm describing my title, it's easier to, like, go back into how I became, you know, came into this title. So really, my job deals with uh, communication. If I had sure. to give one term for it, and it started when I came to Walzer, which is where I work now, um, and I, I came in as a reputation management coordinator. So I was responding to Google reviews and Yelp reviews and Facebook and like doing all this liaisoning with our general managers when customers were happy or when they were more like when they were not happy. And so I really got to form this relationship with them and kind of understand coming in at the bottom like how car sales works or service. And so it was that and then social media kind of came into the role. And so I kind of done these various things and then it transitioned into corporate communications, kind of doing CEO comms, PR, media outreach, which is sort of my bread and butter. And then when we began our diversity journey, diversity kind of came into the work. So uh, about a year ago, about a year and a half ago, my title sure. changed to diversity engagement and foundation and the foundation piece of this. So we have a, an amazing foundation director. She's on my team and she handles really all the grant making and giving that we do in our community, which is about, it's, it depends on, you know, the year, but uh, more than $500,000 a year in yeah. philanthropic efforts from our foundation at Walzer. So together, awesome. you know, we work to make sure that the giving we're doing is elevated in the right ways. Sure. Um, yeah. And obviously you cover a ton of stuff and it's, mm-hmm. It's so cool to see that Walzer is putting so much effort into developing their culture, developing their team, yeah. and really developing leaders because yeah. that's what I think a lot of automotive retailers are missing mm. right now mm-hmm. across the entire nation. Mm-hmm. They they want the output. They want this. They want that. But sometimes they're not willing to invest in their people. Yeah. And people can be our biggest problem or like our biggest asset. Yeah. And there's so much we can invest in our people. So what are some specific things you guys do at Walzer that you're investing in your team? Yeah. I mean, I will argue that people are the biggest asset. So I'll, I'll just yeah. say that. But I think um, people, uh, you know, no matter where you work, you want to know where you're going and, yeah. and you want to know how you're contributing to, to the mission and vision of the company. And you sure. want to know how your work builds on that. Even if you are a lot tech, even if you're, a coordinator, a funding specialist, or whatever that is, you want to know how your work contributes. So having a really clear career path is something that everyone probably wants and needs. Sure. But but somehow, for some reason, it's just really missing in auto. And I think, you know, for a long time, this industry has been kind of afraid to create, and maybe not afraid to create positions, but afraid to kind of create upward mobility within those positions. So if you're thinking about, like, you know, kind of mapping out what that path looks like, maybe it's coordinator to specialist to analyst to you know senior analyst and you, mapping, there's, yeah yeah there's ways to kind of create that that lattice effect for people so they can grow and and having those conversations about um where people see themselves is also a really big part of that but in my own organization you know i spoke about this in, in my panel earlier but um we use a process of of a balanced scorecards so that your yeah. your 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 wins and your losses are documented so that you can say like red yellow green like here's what what went great and why and here's what didn't go so great um, and how you can can improve on that and then your promotions and your successes are are you know measured in a real way without bias you're not saying "Ah, i've worked with him forever he's a great guy or she's a great girl like (laughs) like give her the promotion like no we have real you know kind of um perspectives yeah. on what works, you know, in with KPIs to match it. So we use these balanced scorecards. Um, we do succession planning every year. So again, we have these really in-depth conversations with people that, um, Look at who's ready, ripe, and prime for movement. Who's a trusted professional? Who's who's not quite there yet? All, you know, all of these things. Using those scorecards, that's part of it. And then the other really cool thing that I want to highlight is we do a program called Emerging Leaders, and this is very common in corporate America, and something that I think our dealers and, and vendors could use way more. Um, sure. And so it's it's a group that's ready for the next big thing, and it's it's challenging. It's a very small, elite group of people, and and you're asked to do a case study on a real problem in our company, and names and all those things are changed but my year I did it last year we were looked at um 
you know, efficiency in our, in our shops. We had a shop who was struggling and, and looking at bay layout and tech productivity and, you know, customer pay and things that I knew nothing about. Sure. You're paired with a mentor and, you're, and you write a case study based on this real problem. So through, there's a various, you know, other elements to the program, but it really, it, it's hard and it tests people. and It's a way to grow within kind of your growth structure, if that makes sense. No, it does. And so I 100% agree with that is that too many people are looking at people as a problem instead of trying to fix that. Yeah. And looking at that and saying, what are we doing wrong as an organization? And I think you guys are so far ahead of what other dealers are and automotive retailers are across the nation because it's it's so clear that you guys are willing to invest in your people yeah. and map that and show them like, hey, here's here's where the next step is for you and here's yeah. how we can get there. Yeah. And give them that that scorecard, that report card, look yeah. at that. So someone who doesn't know what a succession plan is, like explain that real fast. Yeah, so so it's a it's a conversation with your top level leaders and you're looking at every member of your team and you're saying, okay, like what is this person articulated to you that where they want to go? Yeah. How are they doing? Um, and and are they ready for movement? Yes or no. Sure. And you're and you're going around and you're documenting that and you're making sure that you're you're kind of um, setting them and yourself up for success so that you have the right people in the right seat at all times. And then that's reviewed on an annual basis. That's kind of what a succession plan looks like. Yeah, so that, you have a awesome. bench ready when you need it. Yeah, so that, exactly. you know, someone leaves or something happens, you can go and pull that right person. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think what's cool about that is not that you're, you know, trying to fix turnover or trying to get like super fast execution when someone leaves, but like that's a very real problem that people have is, you know, whether that person's promoted. Let's say you do have a sales manager and you need to fill that role Mm -hmm. because they got promoted to a GSM. Mm you will have people that are ready for that and, yes. and you know ready to go into the next spot. Right. So let's talk about your map real fast. Let's yeah. say that you do have a salesperson. Now, do you have different routes for them? Is Does it based on their personality? Is it based on what their um, their goals are? Like, what does that look like? So I think the beauty of auto, and I think, again, underutilized, is that there is a lot of different routes you could take and a lot for of sure. different verticals. And, you know, you could be the consummate sales professional who, who wants to sell and, and maybe move into that account executive role or that, you know, that role that really focuses on. Not every salesperson wants to be a manager yeah, or exactly. should be a manager. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I think, you or know, worse, they want to and they shouldn't be, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there's there's kind of a different skill set that comes there. For me, I knew that I wanted to manage people. I'm a people person. I yeah. like getting in the weeds with my people and having yeah. those conversations. But I also like to do the work too. So I knew. So you know, I had to find that fit for me. Um, but I think you know being you you could move up to a gsm i guess if you want but you could also look at inventory you could yeah. look at buying you could look at um you know any maybe you want to get into fix like there's a lot of different ways you could go and just because you're moving laterally doesn't mean you're moving down exactly. and it's on your manager our managers i should say to create sure. a, a system where a lateral move doesn't mean it's a backward step especially sure. if you want to try in a, a new area of the business and i think you know our best gms they are skilled in all areas of the business and i think never stepping foot and fixed or never quite understanding what really happens in parts or whatever or you know and i'm not there are many talents to people so i'm not saying that's everyone but yeah i, I think y- you have to have such a well-rounded depth and breadth of knowledge and that's really hard to do on on your nine to five or your bell to bell or whatever like you you can't do that all um in a short period of time it takes years to build up that skill set and so i think your best general managers are going to be people who have who have been across the business have sat in your bdc understand how those calls come in understand you know all all those different elements for sure especially with changes in technology because let's look at the legacy gm for a second Mm -hmm. you know they've been in automotive for 20 years, yeah. let's say. And back in 2003, things are a lot different now than they were back then. Mm-hmm. We've got so many great pieces of technology that we're able to utilize. Yeah. And having the having GMs that are still involved in uh, the actual operations of it, whether it's in the sales BDC or whether yeah. it's in even in the fixed operations side, it's really cool to see that. And one thing I love that you said, Dana, is that you know a lateral move is not a bad thing, Mm-mm. especially yeah. if they're able to utilize these other great things in their personality Mm -hmm. that they weren't utilizing before. Yeah. So like talk that through. How often do you have someone either go from like the fixed side to the variable side or variable to fixed? All the time. Yeah. All the time. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think. And most dealers, that does not happen. 
Yeah, I mean, it's so cool yeah. you guys do that. Yeah, and I can't I can't give you exact numbers. I guess sure. I don't know, but I but from from the perspective of communicating these store moves, that's I mean, we're you know, my whole job is is to communicate with our people, and I think inclusion comes when you understand the the direction the ship is going. Like I yeah. get it, I'm on board, I'm part of the team, and so that even includes like oh, so and so is moving to Toyota, and so and so is moving from Toyota to Mazda, and and you know, I think when you look at some of um, some of the world class sales organizations, they have it's almost like or or um, you know even hospitals like teaching hospitals you you create these opportunities for those teaching um, experiences to happen and those growth moments to happen it's built into who you are yeah. um, and if you are are so rigid in how you structure that up and down there's never going to be any time or any opportunity to get out of that monthly cycle <laughs> yeah. you know to grow and to try something different and yeah. and, to, and to expand yourself as a person so. Um, we communicate those changes all the time and they happen frequently. Yeah. So Dana, I love that is that you're trying to get your people out of that 30 day cycle. Yeah. The one single yeah. month. Where it's all of a hard. Sudden, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And giving them that map and that guidance to say, Hey, here's where you want to go. Here's what you need to work on. But mm-hmm. Hey, also don't forget you're really good at these couple things. Here. Yeah. So yeah. it's cool that you can document that. Yeah. How often do you guys do a scorecard? Uh, I mean, every quarter. Every every quarter. Yeah, Sorry, cool. there's no question mark on that. Every sure. quarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Every like, quarter. What? <laughs> yeah. Every quarter we do it. So, yeah. um, every employee has a scorecard, and it could depend. Like you know, for for the communications um, specialist who's on my team, his scorecard. He's a party of one. He's the only person in the whole company who has this title because he's you know in a very sure. niche small part of it. Most of our people are in production or in, contributing to the profitability of the company, and and you know and. and so for him, his scorecard is is individual. It looks different from yeah. everyone else's. You know, all of our lot techs, theirs might look the same. All of our CS, our customer specialists, mm-hmm. that's what we call our salespeople, theirs looks the same. It's be, it's based on units and you know per vehicle retail and vehicle service contract penetration. Yeah. So theirs is you know a larger party that's holding that kind of same look and feel, but yeah. you know kind of contributing in a specific way. So. Yeah. So let's talk about mm-hmm. details real fast and scorecard. And actually, before we get to that, can you tell everybody how many employees you guys have between all of your locations? Yes. So we have uh, 2,000 employees, yeah. 26 rooftop dealer group out of Minneapolis. And then we have a luxury campus in Wichita. And in addition to that, we have uh, five affiliate um, rental agencies under That's, Ace Rent-A-Car. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's obviously a very large organization and a lot of people you're trying to do this for. Every person in your company, do they have a scorecard? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I mean, how do you guys... Let's. So the scorecard itself, some of the details that are on there, it's cool for your CS, your um, customer specialist, yeah. how uh, you have it tied directly to revenue generating yes. items. Yeah, and it has to. Exactly. Yeah, yeah like, like it has to make sense. It's not like, oh, they were nice this day. They were mean this day. Right. It's actually key things that are takeaways. So yeah. what are some of the details you have on the scorecard? Um, I mean, so I think if everyone's, I kind of said this earlier, but everyone's looks different. And so, you yeah. know, mine is, is not related to revenue generation, but, but You're right. you know, yeah. indirectly <laughs> yeah. it's related to retention. So For that sure. is my key metric that I'm, that I'm working on is retention through the lens of communication, through the lens of employee engagement and through the lens of, of in, uh, inclusion. So everyone's looks different, yeah. but you know. That yeah, you know, I guess that's that's kind of what I can say about it. There's there's different things that you're aiming for, but it's a very um, specific conversation, a very thoughtful conversation that you have with your manager. And and there might be big groups of people who have the same scorecard, but you're you know kind of beholden to those those KPIs. Yeah, sure. So right before this, you just got done finishing a session. We had Ashley Cavazos in there. We had yeah. Grand Cage. Yeah. Tell us a real quick like synopsis of that, and what were some key takeaways you guys developed oh, together? Oh, it was a really good conversation. So it was about how to create kind of pathways into automotive and to create inclusive spaces once you're in it. And I think some of the key takeaways that we talked about were, you know, how you, how you win at work while still being who you are when you're there, while still having fun, making it sticky, making it worth stay around for. I mean, today it's, it is an employee's market. And if you don't like where you're working, you can go somewhere else because there's lots of options. We're still coming out of, I think, you know, a little bit of the great, um, resignation. And, and for me, now I'm thinking the great retention, like that's where I'm at. And so I think there are a lot of places where you can go if you don't like where you work. And so, um, I, 
when I think about that conversation, it all comes back to how you get great people and you hang on to them once you've got them. Yeah. And I love how you look at the issue of the great resignation and turn that into an opportunity yeah. to be great at something else, which yeah. is retention. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> what are some things that you have in your future that you're looking forward to in the next two to five years? Oh, man. Okay. So um, I'm really pumped about this. At Walzer, I oversee our employee resource groups. And I actually um, have the opportunity and the pleasure to do a, a workshop on this at NADA in February about how to create an employee resource group. Because That's cool. I think, you know, you can be a single rooftop, you can be a multi-rooftop, and it doesn't have to look the same, but they are possible. And at the heart of these groups, what they are is they're employee-led, they're employee-driven, they're meant to create engagement around some topic. Sometimes it's a social demographic, sometimes it's a just an identity or or a status like parenthood. You could that could even yeah. be something young professionals. Like there's lots of ways that that could go. Um, so I oversee our three right now, and we never start employee resource groups just to start them. Like you have to have a, a reason that a and purpose, a exactly. purpose in yeah. the way that it supports your business. But um, next month we're in the process of getting uh, a veteran advisory committee together to start thinking about how we better support our military members, our retired service members, their families, um, and then with the hope that that can evolve into perhaps a full-fledged employee resource group because you talk about um, a population of people that is so prime and ripe and ready to come and transition, you know, or, or take the next step. Yeah. You know, Otto is so perfect for that. Yeah. And, and we have a really large population. So we're, that's what I'm like really excited for in the immediate future. Um, Two to five years from now, I, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I think, Let's get through that think, first, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think our group is on a is on a, a growth um, minded trajectory, sure. and so I expect to see our employee population to continue to grow at, at a fairly quick rate. Uh, perhaps rooftops. You know, it, it, I'm not sure what the future will hold, but I know that that's that's something that we're aiming for. That's exciting. Yeah. How cool. Yeah. So Dana, thanks so much for taking a few moments with us Thank to you. do this. Thanks for being a part of a SodaCon and yeah. the great sessions we have, the great yeah. education now here and i know you've already said this but also i'll say it for you they can connect with you on linkedin yes they can find you at dana cleave yep and i'm sure you would love to help people yes grow, yeah whether it's about culture or things like that yeah you know i just all my last thought that i'll say i was just yeah. talking to someone else about this but they said you know like i would love to see those scorecards you were talking about i'd yeah. like to see some of those <laughs> things and i said I, we all do better when we do better and for me to hold on to you know how i how i form my ergs like what the charter looks like like i won't do that i will happily share those templates with people because yeah. I awesome. think, you know, there is enough room in this industry for all of us to do really, really well by our people. I don't need to hang on to to the things that are working well for us that could work really good for you. Man, Dana, I love that. Thanks so much for taking yeah. a few minutes with us.